a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thank you for coming back to the Films at Home podcast today. I really appreciate all the support, especially as I build out more of this podcast. I record more episodes. There's tons of great content if you want to go back into my first season and earlier into the second season here. But today's episode is a really good one. You guys know if you've been following up with the podcast that a few weeks ago I talked to Justin Beam. He's a special features producer, documentary filmmaker, and that one had a lot of interest from you all. You wanted to learn more about that side of the business and that side of the industry and how this all works. So I've landed another interview here with another great special features producer and filmmaker, Cliff Stevenson. So Cliff has worked on a ton of big studio movies over the last 15 years um we're talking hunger games power rangers uh the new rambo movies he worked on knives out i mean he's got a pretty extensive resume he worked on two of my favorite movies which i'm going to ask him about gamer and they came together which are like two guilty pleasure movies for me uh he's worked on a ton of stuff so we're going to go in here uh, this is after I've done the interview. So I kind of know what we're going to talk about. I'll say this. It's about two hours long, the actual interview. I don't expect anybody to sit down and listen to it all in one in one sitting. If you do, that's amazing. This would be a really good one for like a road trip or if you got a long drive for work or a commute, you could probably do the two parts an hour each way. But it's a long episode. But let me tell you, it is 100% worth watching if you're on YouTube or listening to this episode because we cover so much. We talk special features. We talk about commentary. We talk about what's going on in the industry and how the industry needs to shift. I had some really interesting takeaways that I took from this episode myself. I learned a ton. Cliff is just has an insane amount of knowledge of the physical media world and how all of this kind of can connect together, how it all works where we're thinking about heading into the future. And then at the end, we've even got, you know, some some really interesting news. There's some scoops sprinkled in here throughout. I don't know if they're just first time scoops or, you know, if this information's kind of floating around, but there's some stuff he's working on that we talk about throughout the episode that I don't think is very widespread yet. So it's just a really, really cool episode that I think you guys will definitely enjoy. The full two hours is well worth it. I think you're going to learn so much about the world of physical media, the business of it all, how these special features are created, some recommendations on discs to check out, like even got into like Lionsgate and their new Steelbook line and like how some of this stuff is coming together, how the industry is shifting. So it was a really, really good conversation that you guys should definitely enjoy because Cliff has just so much, so much information to share. We probably could have gone on for another three hours. In fact, outside of the recording, I think I talked to him for about an hour and a half and we did a two hour interview. So like, I just couldn't get enough of them. You guys will really, really like this episode. So sit back, relax, enjoy the episode, and I will talk to you at the end. Okay, everyone. Thanks for coming out to the Films at Home podcast today. We've got Cliff Stevenson here for our interview. Um, I know we talked some special features a, a few episodes back and you guys were all over it. So we're diving back into that world today with Cliff. Cliff, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. You want to give a, a quick introduction on who you are, what you do, what your business is, and, um, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Well, thanks for having me today. I'm actually really excited to talk to you. Uh, I am a special features producer. I've been doing this. I've actually been doing this for about 20 years now. Um, I started, I, I, I started, I, I, oddly enough, I, I started as a DVD reviewer uh, back with DVD file way back in the day, like around 1998, 1999. Um, and at a certain point, I just, when that kind of ended, I I thought, well, if I'm going to tell people what's wrong with their with their discs and their special features, then I should put my money where my mouth is. And so we were living in Denver at the time. And I basically we you know, we packed up. We moved to Los Angeles. I got a job uh, at a company doing DVD QC, uh, you know, where, you know, back in those. I mean, they still do it the same way. But, you know, it's like you had to basically go through every DVD and be like, does the menu go up? Does it go down? You know, does it does it jam? Does it? freeze the disc, you know, is the picture okay? Is the sound okay? And you have to QC every aspect of that disc. So that's kind of where I started. 
and that then kind of segued into the company that I was working with started to do a little bit of, uh, of kind of special feature content. Uh, and so I, I, I started out just writing trivia tracks. Like we had a couple movies that they were going to do trivia tracks back when they actually used to do. You know, it's funny. I think about all these special features we used to do that we just don't do anymore because we kind of have moved on from it or whatever. But, you know, we we do these trivia tracks. And, and so I would write them and you'd have to sit there and come up with all these weird facts and details and time code. And at this time in and this time out, here's what it should say. And that turns into a subtitle. And that's kind of how I started. And then from there, we actually started producing special features for, I want to say seasons three through like eight of The Simpsons on DVD. Um, it was, uh, uh, so I was, I became kind of an associate producer for that, which really just meant, you know, we did whatever, 22 commentaries a season, you know, one for every episode. And I would basically spend all my week coming up with these really elaborate booklets that had all the episode details and, you know, the air dates and guest stars and writers and facts and trivia and, you know, I have images in there. And it would take me all week to do and we would print them out and they would be full color. And then we would go to the commentary sessions and they'd have, you know, music stands and and these books would just sit there so that whoever was coming in for the commentary would be able to have that there, leaf, you know, through it and and have kind of a bunch of details at their fingertips. And so that was that was kind of my my start into that world and and from there um i just was able to sort of start producing my own titles and um and actually what what happened was i was working on the 15th anniversary dvd of la story the steve martin movie uh which is ironic because i actually ended up doing the 30th anniversary of la story on blu-ray so uh i i got two cracks at that title but um uh, we we had gotten we were doing a locations like the the L A of L A story feature so we were going out to all these locations that they'd shot L A story at and kind of we were there with the production designer and we were looking at how these things look today and you know he would kind of go over what they did to them and the and one of the locations for L A story was the Ambassador Hotel and if if anybody knows the Ambassador Hotel it was a very famous landmark kind of hotel in Los Angeles that they. Uh, shot a million movies at um, you know, the graduate was shot there. I think they shot true, true lies there, you know, a bunch of different things. And it was also the, the hotel where Robert Kennedy was assassinated in the ballroom. That's where he gave a speech and he was assassinated in the ballroom. So we got a call saying uh, your, the, the ambassador had been, had been bought by the LA school district and they were going to be tearing it down and turning it into a campus. So we got a call one day and somebody said, hey, you know, we know you're doing this thing with LA Story and you were t looking at the ambassador. We can get you in the, into the ambassador, but it's going to cost, you know, $1,500 to the school district. And you have to shoot it this Saturday morning from 6 to 8 a.m. because you have to work around that. They're, they're literally tearing this hotel down. This is your window. And I went back to the company I was with and said, okay, here's what I need. I need a check for $1,500. We're going to do this. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. They're like, that's not how things work. We have to run this up the, you know, it's got to, it's got to be approved. And we got to, and, and you know, you need to put this off a few weeks. And I was like, there is no, a few weeks. Like it's, this is, this is it. Like if we don't do it, um, we're not going to, we're not going to do it. And, you know, I was able to sort of throw enough of a tantrum that we, we were able to make it work. Um, but we were also, the very last people to shoot anything at the ambassador hotel because they were literally tearing it down around us. But that project was the project where I said, I will never again allow another company to tell me what I can or can't shoot for a special feature um, based on how they want to do things. And so I, I left the company, I started my own production company and I've been doing that since 2006 now. Um, so yeah, so from there I, I've been able to produce, I mean, I've, I was telling you earlier, it's like, I've produced titles that I forgot I had anything to do with. I, you know, it's just at a certain point you, you start rolling through these things and you, you, there are things that I think were three years ago and I look and they were 12 years ago and there are things that I think were 10 years ago and they were four years ago and it just, all this stuff starts to blend together. But, you know, I've been lucky to be able to do, 
the you know the last two Rambo movies as they came out in theaters. I did the first Hunger Games uh, when it when it was released in 2012. Uh, I was able to work on on Hacksaw Ridge, the the, the Mel Gibson directed uh, war movie. Um, you know the first two Crank movies, and then just kind of recently, uh, I, I was able to work on Knives Out, uh, which was a really big deal uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and then I have, you know, in the next uh, four weeks or so, you will see, um, you know, you will see my work on Plane, the Gerard Butler uh, action movie that uh, is currently in theaters. And I think it's a late March uh, Blu-ray and 4K release. Um, and so I did, uh, not only was I able to do features for that, but I was on set for that uh, as well. So that was, that was something where I was able to really kind of control the whole thing, but uh, and that kind of takes us up to today. Today, yeah. So 2006. So you you sort of came. So you started your business. I mean, right in line with sort of Blu-ray launching, right? I mean, that's sort of. I think. Yeah, if I, I was were... really dumb. I got into it right as the DVD market was starting to fade, and they were spending less money on special features. It was like you know the the guys you know friends of mine like like you know. Charlie Lazarica and and you know Robert Meyer Burnett, you know they were in it like when it was like the Wild West boomtown when they were just throwing money at people and being like, here you go, here's a here's a blank check. I stupidly got into it uh, when when it was kind of like, all right, let's be a little more spend thrifty uh, about this. But yes, I, I I did get into it right as Blu-ray was taking off, and so I was kind of in. I was in that mix of of Blu-ray and HD DVD and kind of what thing was going to happen and the the format war at the time and um, there there was a lot of interesting things you know because if people that remember you know a lot of people probably don't remember because Blu-ray has just been around for so long now I mean it seems weird to say that but you know people that remember you know initially there were a lot of things Blu-ray couldn't do that HD DVD could do things like picture in picture and and bonus view content. So, and and at the time, you know, Blu-ray was limited to 25 gigs, where HD DVD was 30 gigs. So there was this weird back and forth where, you know, we were constantly trying to figure out how to make Blu-ray as good as HD DVD. HD DVD, which seems weird to say now, but you know, there, you know, so on the initial crank, you know, we did a picture-in-picture -picture track, but you couldn't actually do that within the format at the time. So we did a burned in version of the picture in picture track on crank uh that was just a complete separate encode a second encode on the disc of that picture in picture stream um and that was the kind of stuff and then by the time you got a year or two into it they they kind of figured it out and we were able to do it for real but it was you know that was also that was kind of technically the wild wild west where you were every studio was trying to kind of outdo the other studios and get out with something really cool. And you had maximum movie mode, you know, from Warner brothers, but it is funny to see like all those things have kind of gone away and they're, you know, they don't, they don't do a lot of those anymore. No, I, I know I was reading, there was an article that came out the other day for, for whatever reason, somebody from, Oh, uh, I'm forgetting now variety, maybe Forbes. somebody wrote an article about like, I miss old DVD menus and just like, the interactive, the little Easter eggs you'd find in a menu. And if you, you hit up, down, left, right, you know, you go to some secret screen and um, you'd get some bonus content. And yeah, I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're missing, missing that. But, you know, we also, I, I get where the business is going and the formats have come a long way. So like yeah. I, I have nostalgia for the DVD menu, but I do love a good 4k picture. So I can't complain too much. You know, we've, well, and, we've and come I'll, a long way. I'll, I'll tell you, it's not, you know, it's not that it has gone away. It, it's that there's less people advocating for it on the side that should be advocating for it. So, you know, like it's, it's interesting. I produced the special edition for swimming with sharks way back in the day. And, um, George Wang, the, the writer director had been, uh, like an assistant over at uh, Sony in the 90s. And he had become friends with Robert Rodriguez because El Mariachi was just sort of getting picked up by Sony and they were doing a whole bunch of distribution. And, and we got a thing from Robert Rodriguez. He had drawn this cartoon of, of George that was like George's last day. And it was basically like a caricature of George, like eating his boss or whatever at Sony. And, uh, and we actually 
That was an Easter egg because it got to us late. That was an Easter egg on the Swimming the Sharks disc. I don't even remember how you find it now. But we also did a thing where Robert Rodriguez had recorded this audio to talk about what it was. And so we had designed it so that when you got to the sketch, if you hit enter again, it took you another layer. There was an Easter egg within the Easter egg that then had this Robert Rodriguez thing where he was talking about his friendship with George and, and all this other stuff. Um, uh, but, but I will also say, you know, and again, it, it has to do with who's advocating on plane and nobody will probably know this because I, why would you, um, the menus for plane, which were actually my idea, uh, are, you know, when you see them, you know, it's basically the back of a, a of an airline seat and it's got the little screen in it and you, you know, you have the seat, which is not that big a deal. But what we did was I reached out to Daniela Pineda, who's who plays Bonnie in the movie and has become a friend of mine since since production. And I said, hey, do you want to do the announcement for for the menus? And she was like, yeah, that like that sounds rad. And so she recorded the actual menu audio, which is basically her in character, basically like you're on a flight and she's, you know, today's in-flight movie is playing, starring Gerard Butler and da 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 and it runs this time and English audio is on track one. And it's actually really kind of neat and clever and it's just a, it's its own thing. But, but we actually got the actress from the movie to record uh, the audio for the menu, which just rarely kind of happened. So it, it was a nice... It was a nice thing to be able to do, uh, and I, I doubt I doubt highly people will notice or appreciate it, but I did. No, I think they. I mean, that sounds super cool to me. Nobody, you know, I, I shouldn't say nobody, but so many times now, you open a disc and it's it's the it's a flat image or it's a thirty second loop and it's play scenes bonus, you know, whatever audio. Like, there's your four even, buttons. Even if you if you even get that much, I mean, a lot of times now you're just getting sometimes just jump right in subtitles you're not even getting <laughs> chapter listings or anything else and it's like because the authoring has been the one place that they've been able to be like well we'll save money by authoring less or, or putting less options in the menu so that cuts down on qc that cuts down on on the authoring costs and you can push out these titles cheaper but it but it is at the expense of the experience i think yeah no definitely i mean that's that's part of the thing you know when you pop in the disc I I mean, I'd love to be greeted by somebody from the movie each time. Kevin, well, I think you, you worked on Clerks 3, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the intro that Kevin Smith does on that Blu-ray disc was fantastic. I was like, you know, why why aren't more? He, I mean, and he gets it. I know that he gets it, like, and he gets physical media and, and has a love for it. But man, that was so refreshing. I actually recorded it, and I think I posted it. I posted it on YouTube and everywhere else, and I said, you guys need to buy the Clerks 3 disc because look how cool, like, there's a real, you feel like you've made an impact when you play that disc. You're like, oh, the director is telling me I did a good thing by buying this. Like those types of things were really, really cool. Um, yeah, that was, and that was my idea. I mean, we, we, we shot a thing with Kevin. We, we, we recorded the commentary and we had Kevin and, and Jeff and uh, uh, Austin. They were in the room and then Brian O'Halloran was in New Jersey. And I think, uh, 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 I can't remember his name. The other guy was in like Arizona or something. Trevor was in Arizona. And um, Kevin had to record some some stuff basically like, you know, drops on digital, you know, you can buy it tomorrow, you can buy it today. He was just recording stuff. So we had the camera set up, we had a prompter set up. And I just sort of said, hey, do you want to do like an intro for the disc? Because that's another thing that they used to do a lot of. Like they would, you know, Kevin would always record an intro for whether it was Clerks 2, Clerks 1, he would always record an intro. So I said, you know, do you want to do an intro to basically, like before we even get into the menus, to just talk about, like, thanks for buying the disc and, you know, give people kind of an, uh, an update of what they're doing. And he was like, yeah, totally. So Kevin just, you know, we finished all of our other stuff. We got all of our business out of the way. And then I said, all right, great. Do, you know, let's just intro it. And he he did the intro. That's all just one take. And, and, and uh, you know, I cut some... Because I was there, I had shot a little bit of them recording the commentary, and we had some of the stuff from the doc. So I was able to cut in a few clips from uh, the features as well to sort of tease what was going to be coming up. So I, yeah, I was really happy uh, that we were able to do that, and and 
you know, get, you know, and, and, you know, in terms of the overall experience, here's another thing that, uh, that, that we were able to do, and I've not seen anybody pick this up yet. Um, but it's one of my greatest achievements, it, you know, cause I work a lot with Lionsgate and I, I, I've long had a pet peeve where digital customers get treated better than physical customers. Uh, you know, and, and I've had conversations with various studios where they're like, well, we'll have this special feature, but we'll make it a digital exclusive. And I'm like, why? They're paying less. Like they're paying less money and they're going to get more content, really. Um, but I, I was I was finally able to convince Lionsgate about maybe two years ago. Um, you know, a big pet peeve of mine is putting a disc in and then having to sit through a minute of FBI warnings and policy things and trailers or whatever you have, and it's all locked out. And I was like, why are we abusing, like, why are we, why are we mistreating people that have spent a lot of money on, on a physical disc, on physical media? And, you know, to their credit, they came back and they were like, all right, so how should we do this? So starting on, I want to say Wander Darkly might have been the first title, but we definitely had it like by the time Dirty Dancing came out. If you look at a Lionsgate disc now, when you put it in, the Lionsgate logo comes up, which is skippable. It goes straight into the menu. And if you hit play movie, it goes straight into the movie. There is no, you don't, you don't wait around for FBI warnings. You don't wait around. You don't get forced trailers. We author the discs now in such a way that it is user friendly and it is, it is customer, you know, friendly. And I've not seen anybody pick up on that. You know, nobody came out and said, oh, wow, this disc actually just kind of plays right away and you don't have to sit for, for you know, because I, I would always joke that it's like every time you're stealing 30 seconds of my life every time you want to tell me not to steal from you, uh, which always just seemed really weird and ironic. Um, so, you know, to their credit, they've changed their authoring spec completely to where it is get in, get out, all that other stuff that you put FBI warnings and disclaimers and all that stuff. It's all at the end. It's all after. Uh, and that's when it pops up. And, and so, you know, that's one of those things that I think they really deserve a lot of credit on is is being very customer focused and and really pushing physical media in a way that I don't know a lot of other studios are doing right now. Um, but that's one of those that's one of those situations where you know that's a really hard thing to push through to get somebody to go, hey, let us skip past your logo. But but you're like, but if I buy it on iTunes, that's exactly what I'm doing. I go in, I hit play movie, and the movie just plays. Like, why are you forcing me who spent Thirty dollars on this 4K disc. Why are you forcing me to sit through all this garbage before I just want to watch the movie? And I already paid for it. You don't have to tell me not to steal from you. I already bought the disc. Like it's fine. Um, so that yeah, that's one of those things that that uh, we've been doing on those discs for about two years now. But I don't think anybody noticed. Huh. I, I mean, I I'll fully admit I didn't I didn't notice. But maybe it was just because it was so refreshing that I was able to just get right into the movie that I sort of just I. <laughs> I was locked in. It was like, I put the disc in, here's the movie, which is, yeah. I mean, that's what I'd want. Cause they, they always have the, the unskippable stuff will drive me absolutely nuts. Yeah. If I can't, if, if it's there and I can skip it. Okay. Still a pain, but man, sometimes they put in, I've even had unskippable trailers and I'm like, really? Like I, <laughs> I bought yeah. this movie. I, I'll, I can watch your trailers if you want to put them somewhere else, but like, don't don't force me to watch them. Like I'm at my house. I'm not at AMC, you know, don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to upsell me. I already spent 30 bucks on your disc. So that is, that is very refreshing. And I, I do like what Lionsgate has been doing. So even more credit to them. I didn't know that, but all the work they've been doing with like the steel books and the really interesting artwork and the re-releases of some stuff. Uh, I mean, they've clearly, shifted in a way that the other studios haven't to like catering to who I think the consumer is now for that type of stuff. And I think they're winning for it. Like I, those, those steel books they're putting out always sell out. Like those are they're crushing it. I mean, it's gone. like, and, and it's even stuff that's been released before, you know, some of it, it's not always a brand new 4k, but still it'll sell out right away just because they do a unique artwork. They got those slip cover 
the the kind of multi-layered art they just take care of people with with what they're putting out so that's yeah, that's great that to hear started, you know, I, I i think that started with knives out with the with the best buy knives out that's the it first had one i remember the book yeah it was that book artwork and then it had and then it had that easter egg where if you if you turned the slip cover around it pointed to the killer um you know it was like that was the kind of thing that they're they're always like what's a clever version of this what's and then you look at like you know like look i love disney as much as everybody else but those star wars those those disney 100 star wars steel books are like what are you doing like like that like who who asked for that? I, I can't imagine anybody asking for that. And I, you know, I know that there's, they're, you know, they're, they're coming up with a series or doing, doing what they're doing with it. But, but I think there has been a, a loss at the studio level in a lot of studios where they stop thinking about the consumer and it's more about what their agenda is. And so it becomes, well, I'm going to do pop art because I'm a fan of pop art. And I always go, I don't care if you're a fan of pop art. If it's terrible artwork, I, as the consumer, do not want it. I would rather have Fright Night with the poster on it than have some weird abstract thing that you found some odd artist. Now, if you do it well, okay, fine. If you do something great. But I think that that a lot of times they get locked into this thing, and it becomes almost an agenda that they have to fulfill. And it's like there's one person that is the champion of this thing, and uh, and you know, it's a lot of times it's hard to get around that person. Yeah, and that that the Disney stuff was, and I, I have I've had good conversations with with people there about physical media and. There, there are people there who get it and they want to do, and that's where you'll get something like, like Cinderella getting a 4k release for the hundredth anniversary of Disney. Perfect. Do more of that. The star Wars hundred and it's like, that is, <laughs> we're talking about a hundred years of Disney and star Wars is what, like the last eight years they've owned them. I mean, it's this yeah, tiny, and those, they don't even really have anything to do with those. It's like, you like, if you want to put out three, put out the three you made, not the three that you had nothing to do with. Right. Like it's not really a part of Disney's history unless you're in the, you're just so business focused. Well then, yeah, it's a huge part of your business because it was a massive acquisition, but it's not really part of the legacy of Disney in a way Cinderella is, or sleeping beauty could be or something like that. So like, yeah, there is there's there's conflict because they're they're focused on the marvel the star wars the stuff they can print money with and they're focused on their streaming so that that hurts the physical media but again it's- how much like look i have i have the zavi you know star wars ones that they did that have all the posters you know where the big controversy was the empire strikes back having the teaser poster instead of the gone with the wind poster that everybody actually wanted and like that was the big controversy i'm so glad i would like all of a sudden i'm like Thank God I've got that teaser poster empire now, because if I had to go with this. And so this idea of like, oh, we've got this thing and we want to celebrate it. Well, how many more copies would you sell if you did the version that people actually want? Don't do the version you want. Do the version I want. Like, don't give me don't give me the steelbook you like. Give me the steelbook I like and I'll buy it. You're not buying it. You're just going to take a copy home from the office. So I don't understand why you're the one making that decision. Uh, and, it, and it baffles. And it's, you know, that's kind of across a lot of different studios where you, you, you it's so hit and miss with stuff. And you just go like, God, like how, how did the people that did this also do that? That's the part where, you know, I, for, as, for as connected as I am and, and conversations I have, I will fully admit I do not understand some of the logic uh, that comes out in terms of like why this title gets chosen, but the, you know, it's like how, how we went a whole year and, and Sony did not release Tootsie for the 40th anniversary, but we got, you know, Oliver. Like, yeah, really? they, Sony does some, they, they had one that uh, I'm, I'm now I'm forgetting the name of it. It's, it's on its way to me right now. I'm trying to find it was this movie that Sony put out on 4k. And I was just like, wow, like who, who was asking for that one? Unless there was just somebody super passionate about it. Like, 
within Sony that decided. Well, and that's it. That's really what it comes down to is you had one person there that had some juice that said, that's, you know, that's the thing that I'm, that I'm into. And, uh, you know, and so that stuff gets pushed through, but I, I'm just, I, you know, I look at these things and I'm like, you had, you had Tootsie, like one of the greatest comedies of all time it was on the AFI list. It's on all these, you know, it was nominated for best picture, nominated for best director, all these things. And you let the whole 40th anniversary go by without any mention of, even if you were going to license it out to Criterion, I'm sure Criterion would have taken it last year. Yeah. As yeah. a 4K. Well, that's uh, a whole different issue is why, why are we not doing more licensing out to these people who do put an emphasis on physical media as well? Like that, because in they've cut physical media departments for, you know, it's streaming took over. There's, there were layoffs in physical media everywhere. The departments got cut. So if that's the issue and it's a capacity thing too, like Criterion has a team, they'll do it. Arrow has a team. Shout has a team. Kino Lorber has been licensing a ton of stuff. It's like, why, why not? And I've been talking to people in the industry and I can't wrap my head around it because to me, that's just put, put a price on the licensing. You do literally nothing as major studio other than approvals and you cash that check (laughs) and you probably get residuals off the sale too. So like, it just feels like a no brainer when they're struggling to break profits in streaming. That is like, that's nothing but profit for them just license it out to somebody right. else and they'll, they'll deal with the manufacturing and everything well, else look think about it we live in a world where the chuck norris movie sidekicks has a 4k release and three men and a baby the number one movie of 1987 has no blu-ray release it never even got released on blu-ray and and, and you're like how like i mean i'm grateful that we're getting obscure things and we're getting you know the things that we're getting but there's also this weird chasm of of like but what about this other stuff like you like where's rocketeer in 4k like why can't why aren't we getting we don't even have four you know we don't have it on disney plus in 4k you know we got willow we got honey i shrunk the kids on on disney plus but it's like there's things on there i mean it took forever for them to put nightmare before christmas in 4k on disney plus and i was like that should have been that first year should have been one of the 4K transfers that they did. And but when it's streaming, what's the financial incentive? If you're already subscribing, what's the incentive for you to do a new transfer? If you're not losing subscribers because Nightmare Before Christmas is only in HD and not in 4K, then then there's no reason for you to spend that money. So that's the other problem with it. And that's why you know, I would get very irritated with people. I get, I get in trouble a lot because I, I say things, maybe I shouldn't say, but you know, people will, something, a, a title will get announced, especially like in the twilight time days, you know, a title will get announced and they go, oh, that's too expensive. I'll wait until it's 10 bucks. And I'm like, well, if you wait till it's 10 bucks, you're not going to get another title after this because you know, you have to buy these things at a, at a at a price sometimes in order to ensure that more stuff gets sold. Not everything can be a bargain bin Walmart disc. You, you, you know, you are going to have to pay for something that is worth the money. And I understand not wanting to pay for something that's bad. Um, but but a lot of times it was just people wanting, I mean, really wanting something for nothing. And that's, you know, a lot of it where you're like the the more you guys it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy of the longer you guys hold out not buying physical media because you're waiting for black friday or you're waiting for for the price to drop or you're waiting for you know you get you want to get it for 5 bucks the longer you wait for that to happen the less chance another title comes in behind it because the studio is looking at their at their numbers and they're going well this didn't sell very well and if they're you know and it's not like any of the studios are making a ton of money on physical media right now. It's not like 4K is lining everybody. You know, this is not the DVD days where they're selling 7 million copies of something and, you know, supermarkets are carrying it and, you know, video stores still exist and all, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're getting by on the margins. And, and the, the problem is when, when you hold back buying stuff, it basically sends a message that, we don't want it. We're not interested in buying it. And so, you know, like Young Guns is a good example of a, of a title that was so bad 
and sold so poorly that nobody thought anybody wanted it. And it took a long time to sort of start to convince people that there was value to it. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard. Somebody's got, basically somebody's got to be, you know, the first penguin in the water. Somebody's got to be the one to be like, yeah, we got to buy this stuff. If we buy, that's why I was kind of always for Blu-ray and certainly 4K. And this is the part that gets me in trouble. Going into more of a Laserdisc model where the prices were higher, but the, the volume was lower. I would rather pay more for a 4K, a good 4K copy of something and have it be profitable than pay half as much but not get another title because this one didn't sell as well as everybody thought it was going to. Um, and, and that's where it's kind of on the consumer a little bit to be like, that's why I saw your video from the other day where you're basically like, you got to support this stuff. If you support it, if you do these things, if you, if you, if you stand up and say, these are the things we want, you know, they'll, they'll come back to you. And if, 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 uh, you know, if Disney sells a lot of Blu-rays and 4Ks, they'll release more Blu-rays and 4Ks. If they don't, they don't, they won't. Yeah. It's all just, it's all just money. And that's, that's yeah. what I keep. And, and I like, I get it. I, Cause I do talk about like, you obviously, you want to set a budget. You don't need to buy every single thing that comes out and buy it at full price. You know, I think even if you buy a disc and it releases at say $28 and you get it for 20, you know, at least yeah. you're still, you're, you're not waiting till it's the bargain bin, $5, $7 black right. Friday. You're still supporting it. So you, you sort of have to make that list and prioritize this. I'm getting yeah. day one this I'm getting here, but the, and I'm all for that. Like I do buy titles when there's something that comes out and people think I don't buy anything anymore, which is such a, such a crazy thing because I literally buy more now than I ever did before I was making (laughs) YouTube videos. You guys on YouTube have made me buy more. So like, trust me, I know I get some review copies and stuff sent to me. I'm buying more than I ever did before I was making videos. Um, But there's like this, I've talked to people in the industry too, and there's like this weird double-edged sword for titles on Blu-ray right now where in Paramount did this and they put out like a fatal attraction and it was a 4k master, but it was only on Blu-ray and then it sold really well because people supported it. And then they released it on 4k, you know, within the year and that a lot of people felt burnt because like, well, we, we supported you and we bought right. this thing and your sales were good enough. So now you're like making us buy it again. And it's, that's, I, I wish that there was some sort of program because they do this on digital. Like they will just upgrade your titles from HD to 4k sometimes, or do it for a very small price. If you want to upgrade, I wish there was some sort of program where it was like, well, I supported your Blu-ray and you're now putting out a 4k because I bought the Blu-ray, I don't need to spend $35 again. I can get it for X amount with an upgrade program because that's the only thing that's been burning people on the Blu-ray side lately is I'm hearing from a lot of people, I'm not buying that because I know it'll get a 4K. And in my head, I'm like, well, if you don't buy it, it won't get a 4K though. So like, how do you, how do you win? And and understandably, and listen, that argument, that argument I'm totally behind. The, The idea of, of not doing, and, and a good example of that is 48 Hours. I never bought that uh, Paramount Presents, or, you know, what it, because I had it on iTunes. It automatically got upgraded at some point when the Paramount Presents came out. So I, it's like, all right, well, I've already got the 4K version now. I don't need the Blu-ray version of it. And then when the when the 4K disc got announced, I I went and bought those. So. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating that people go out and burn money and, and waste money at all. I, you know, that, that burns me as much as it burns anybody else, because there's no reason, there's no reason to do it. And, and hopefully it feels like maybe Paramount is making a little bit of a shift uh, where we're getting, you know, we're getting Dragon Slayer right away. We're getting, uh, but then, you know, it's like they didn't do young Sherlock Holmes, but I don't, but that also didn't go 4K on digital, so I don't know if that was just you know there's a, there's a couple of like middle things in there I don't understand, but it but it does seem like you know with Double Jeopardy and 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 with Dragon Slayer like th- that they are starting to come around to maybe 
putting more of those things in in the pipeline earlier and it, that that I'm all for. I'm I'm not I'm not saying go out and buy something just to buy it, especially if it's not something that you want. Um, you know, so if Paramount's putting out a title on Blu-ray and it's got a 4K on iTunes or Vudu and you're just going to get upgraded for free, you'd be dumb to go buy the Blu-ray. As much as I love physical media, there's no reason to buy that Blu-ray because I'm never going to watch that disc anyway. I'm going to end up watching the 4K Dolby Vision stream on iTunes and never pull the disc out. I don't, you know, unless you're packing the disc with a bunch of extra features. But and and that is see this is where this gets me in trouble too. I was vehemently against that upgrade program that iTunes had because I I just I thought it was dangerous. I thought it set a really bad precedent and I was like imagine the concept of taking your Fatal Attraction Blu-ray that you've had for 10 years and walking into Best Buy, putting it on a shelf, grabbing a 4K disc, unwrapping it, and just walking out of the store. It sounds insane, but that's essentially what that upgrade program is. It's just there's not a physical product to exchange, but you're essentially, you know, they're spending money to, to redo this transfer, to add new special features, to do whatever they're going to do, and then because of one out one retail one retail outlet one one partner let's say um they're not being compensated for that and, and I, I just thought it was really dangerous and it set a it set a really dangerous mentality where people started to expect that well no i know this thing is better but i shouldn't have to pay for it to be better and I was like, well, you, you need to evaluate what you're getting and if there's value in, like if iTunes, like I see people all the time get really upset because a Warner title doesn't upgrade automatically uh, and they get really upset because they were supposed to get it upgraded. And I was like, well, you still got what you paid for. You paid for, you paid for this movie in HD. So you're not, you're not out anything. Now, if you paid for it in 4K and then they downgraded you to HD, then that's a, that's a complaint I hear, and, and I would think is totally valid. But I think that the upgrade thing is a really tricky thing because it creates an expectation. And I, I'm watch, I'll, I'll watch the comments in your video just start to scroll as we hit this part of the video uh, with people angry with me. Um, but it creates a it, it creates an expectation that I don't think is tenable long term. In terms of, you can either have a lot of stuff for very little money. Or you have to pay for it. Like, it's not, you can't just keep getting stuff and not paying for it because eventually that tap will get shut off and there will be no, um, there will be no new product at all. And that goes back to the first point of like, you know, if you want stuff, you, you're going to have to buy it because you want them to release the next title. So if Real Genius sells well, Sony will go and they'll look at like, well, what's another title? comparable to real genius okay great like real genius never even got a blu-ray release he got one of those mod you know choice collection releases so it essentially jumped from dvd to 4k um but i would assume that it sold fairly well uh and hopefully you know sony looks at those numbers and goes okay great what's another title that is in that same vein or has those same actors or is this you know is the same genre because that's probably now a safe bet to sell well and and that's that's where I think you've been really on the mark in terms of like how you have to support these things and how you have to sort of look at sales as that's you know when they when they say vote with your wallet that's what it is it is telling the studio this is the thing that I'm willing to pay for this is the amount of money I'm willing to pay for it um, if you're somebody that waits until it's five dollars and the studio sees well they're only willing to pay five dollars for it we're not going to make a profit on this therefore we won't release it yeah. No, and that that is that that is the top. That's where you have to, as the collector, I tell people like you, you definitely can't buy everything. You, you shouldn't be expected to. People, other people will fill in the gaps for you who like yeah. those things that you don't like. Yeah, like buy what you love. But if you love it, you you should support it and don't even be worried. You know, oh, I spent twenty five dollars and and now it's eighteen. It's like well, but you love the thing. You supported it. You know, it's. Yeah. See, that's a thing I don't, I don't understand. Maybe it's just because I 
came from the Laserdisc era, where things were 40, 50, 60, 100, $200, where it was like, that would be my whole check to go buy Laserdiscs. And it'd be like, those are, I, you know, this DTS version of Crimson Tide is $60. And it's like, imagine explaining to somebody today, like, oh, no, no, this disc that is 480 resolution with a DTS soundtrack is going to cost you $60. Oh, and you have to flip it over in the middle and change disc, but don't worry about it. Um, but I see that a lot where I'll see people go, oh, God, I love that movie. I'm, oh, I'm so glad that movie is coming out. I'll, 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 I'll get it when it hits 10 bucks. And I'm like, well, how much do you really love it then? Like, if, if when I see stuff that I go, oh, I love that, you know, when, when something gets announced from Kino Lorber, and I'm like, I never thought we'd get that on 4K. Okay, awesome. I'm all in. I'm day one. I want it right now. And, you know, I'm not going to spend, 60 bucks for it like i like i would have when i was younger but i'm also not going to be like all right when's the next barnes and noble sale to you know stock up on all my criterions it's like ah you know what wally comes out i get wally day one all right good i'm all in yeah i think it's a tough it's the mentality's change i i think it's this cost analysis in people's heads where they go well, Netflix is whatever, 15 bucks a month. Right. And I have, you know, I have 5,000 movies. So in my head to pay the 25 for one is like, I shouldn't have to pay that much. It should be, you know, it should be dirt cheap. It should be, it should be five bucks for a movie. But well, there's and, a lot and, more that goes into these things than what and, goes on. The mentality of that also where, where it's gotten a little bit, it's gotten a little bit warped is, is that same Netflix mentality where, yeah, you're paying 15 or 20 bucks a month, but you have access to thousands of things. And so when you look at it, you go, oh, this is all just free content. This doesn't cost me anything. So then when you look at this other movie and you go, why would I pay for this movie when this movie, I can watch Mask of Zorro on Netflix for nothing. Why would I pay 30 bucks for it? And it's like, well, that's the difference between a consumer and a collector. A collector just wants it in their collection. So they have it whenever they want it. A consumer is just looking to buy something when the price is low enough. And that's and where it's shifting right now. And that's what I keep trying. And, and I'll say like to Paramount's credit, when that whole thing dropped with uh, where they, they burned a couple people and people were all in my comments about the, the discs. And I talked to them um, and, you know, the, to, to their credit, they said, hey, look, like the market as a whole just changed. Yeah. And so you're going to see way more 4K stuff coming out from us to begin with. And we've made an adjustment on a couple of the more popular ones to give people that option. Like you, you don't have to upgrade it. Like I get that. Nobody's forcing yeah. your hand. But now you do have the option because they've seen the market shift. But I keep telling them like it is. And we kind of talked about this. Like you need to stop making product in the physical media world for you internally at Disney, Paramount, wherever, and you need to stop making it for really the average consumer because that is not where they are. Like it is, yeah. it is now a collector's market. Like you should really look at what yeah. vinyl is doing. And you're targeting a, a consumer that no longer exists. That. Right. And, and it's totally different even from five years ago. It's definitely different from 10 years ago. Like, and nobody's really I'll, I'll give Lionsgate credit because they've definitely shifted the last couple of years. And Paramount has shifted. Like doing a Paramount Presents line, that's a big deal for a studio. Not a lot of people are doing that. I'll be so honest. I, when, I, when Paramount did that Paramount Presents line, I'll be totally honest. I publicly said I give it five titles because Paramount had notoriously been really skittish about their lines. We have the Sapphire line. We have the platinum line we have the you know and and they they constantly were changing their line and they couldn't really land on anything so when they did paramount presents i was like all right i like i I've, I've been to this play before i've seen this and it, it, i give it five titles and then it, they'll burn out and then somebody new will come in and they'll decide they want to do some other you know paramount peak or something like that or you know whatever it's going to be so the fact that they've stuck with it for a couple of years and they've actually grown those numbers uh, and I give a lot of credit for that, to be honest with you. I give a lot of credit to, uh, to that, to, to Criterion, to Shout, 
to, you know, places that were like, we're going to number these. We're going to, you know, these are going to be collector's editions. They're going to have slip covers. They're going to have this. They're gonna, that they were, they were catering to the collector, not the consumer. And in doing so, the studios had to kind of step back. All of them, some of them have, have made that adjustment. Others have not to say, okay, great. That is, that is now the new model going forward. Um, and I think that, you know, there's there's a lot that can be learned from those boutiques because they were the ones that really predicted, you know, Lionsgate with their Vestron line, you know, where it was like that's, you know, it's essentially a, a, a mini major version of of a, a, of a Shout Select uh, or, you know, something like that. So um, th- that has for sure been the boutique's contribution to to where the market is 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 heading and i think that you know it's been it, it's been interesting watching the studios kind of scramble to catch up to the little guy um uh but even but even within that within that world we're not all the way there yet because when you go into best buy on tuesday afternoon and all the steel books are already sold out um you know that's i it's like it shouldn't turn into the hunger games for me to pick up a steel book of, you know, some catalog title that, uh, you know, I, I, I never saw, I think Godfather one, I never saw the Godfather one steel book in store. I didn't, I didn't need it cause I had the blue fans version, but, um, but, uh, you know, it's like those things would sell out and, and never, you know, clerks three, I don't, I don't know if clerks three ever got replenished and that's the only 4k version out there. There is no standard 4k version out there i am sure at some point they will they will repress it and and do a a second run i just don't know uh, i have no idea when that'll be but that's sold out fairly quickly and so if you want it in 4k you're kind of out of luck yeah i do i do cringe a little bit when i see the uh, uh, steelbook exclusive packaging exclusives for retailers that's you know all good i know it's a real pain and then when i see the format exclusives at like a best buy that does I cr- I cringe a little bit because I know they're only going to order three for every store and it's like going to be impossible to find. They've done it with like uh, I think they've done it with Lionsgate a, a, a few times or there's been an A24 Bodies 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 was a 4K exclusive to there Best Buy. Just, uh, oh oh uh, uh, Strange World that just happened with uh, with Strange World at uh, Best Buy the yeah. Disney movie. Where the four K steelbook is the only I think I think you can get it through the Disney Movie Club as well as a four K as an exclusive through them, but that's another one where if you if you wanted it four K you had to go to Best Buy and you had to get the steelbook version and you had to probably get it on day one because it wasn't going to be available and that uh, hurts like the sales too I'm like why why are we yeah why are we making it more difficult for people to support port right we should <laughs> this should be pretty widely available otherwise we're never going to know how well this could have done so yeah some of the, i mean and i think that's just growing pains like they're trying to figure out the collector mindset and like what's going to work and uh they're all sort of sony in their columbia classic sets and paramount presents and vestron video and like they're all sort of just they're trying to figure it out and i, I like I'm glad they are because you're right. Those boutique labels, like there's a reason Vinegar Syndrome can put out sidekicks on 4K and it's just because they have such an obsessive fan base that they know they'll they'll support that movie and they'll pay a premium price for it. I mean, I'm one right here. Like I've bought. I mean, they know their sales numbers before they announce it. That's the thing with with a place like Vinegar. They know all of their, they know how much it's going to cost. They know how much it's going to make. They know how many copies they're going to sell. They have all that stuff locked down before they even make the announcement. So it's it's a safe bet for them to put that thing out. They know exactly what the profit on that's gonna be. And so for them, it's like, yeah, they don't need to get it in stores because it's it's not gonna matter anyway. They can sell it direct to you and, and keep all the money and, and they know they're gonna sell out. I'm so curious why more of the studios aren't doing that because they you could do a similar thing there where you where you can find out a, if there's a Disney catalog title that you're going to put out on 4K, I mean, you could go out and figure out that's gonna, okay. That's going to do fifty thousand. So let's make that many, yeah. and then if it does more, well, we'll let's make more. That's great. But like, 
you you have a pretty good idea based on just buzz and i mean do, do a survey in this world like there's people like <laughs> like i would love to put a survey out there for somebody and say this is from disney you guys fill this out tell them what you want if enough people are interested they're going to make it because it's it's set profit and it's like i had somebody pitch that at one point and said why yeah why aren't they doing that why aren't you basically doing like a pre-order system where yeah, like something. you give them a window and you say between this date and this day, almost like a Kickstarter, we're, we're going to do from the 1st to the 30th. If you pre-order it, if we hit this number, we will, we will press it. We will release it and, 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 you know, get it in, get it out. Uh, and I, I, I agree. I think it would be a very smart way uh, uh, to, but, but again, like it's like I said way earlier, I, I can't, explain how, how decisions get made or why things i mean i don't know why i don't know why you know they were they're, they're pressing karate kid 3 in international markets but we had a burn disc here until the box set came. you know it's like I, I i don't know i it's like well you already paid for all the stuff you you i don't understand why you're burning them here but you're pressing them all over the world i i don't always understand the decision making me either even as i try to talk to more people and i try to you know i did this podcast so i could talk to more people in this world and i'm i'm really hoping on my we're i'll throw out a teaser here but i'm pretty sure i'm going to have somebody from paramount on here soon so i can talk to them about that i'm really hoping i can do vinegar syndrome as well and we've been talking because i'm super curious about you know how they have built that business model and how it's been so successful so I just want to learn more about it too because it it baffles me as much as as anybody else. Even well, it's constantly shifting. That's the other part of it is it's it's you know it's different today than it was for sure three years ago, for absolute sure ten years ago. You know, it just it's it's constantly, you know, you're you're constantly evolving. Every year, I think, oh, this is the last year. This is it. This is the last year that it's gonna. And I've been saying that for ten years. <laughs> no a lot of people have and i mean it is it's it's shrinking but i was looking at numbers the other day and everybody talks about how great the vinyl market has been for music and if you actually look it's still i was trying to do the numbers and there weren't great like sales numbers but doing the math in my head i was like that's actually pretty similar in size to what they're still doing for dvd blu-ray and 4k And yes, I know one's going up and one's going down, but one is so celebrated and one is constantly like, this is dead. This is not going anywhere. Like it, it, I think it will plateau at some point. And like, we're going to find out where that market actually is right now for people. And then that will help hopefully set some sort of baseline for studios to like make rational decisions and not just sort of make these, like some of it. Yeah. Just doesn't make sense. And I'm like, it's probably because they're guessing. And they really don't, they don't know sometimes. So I I get where it comes from, but like the data is out there and you could certainly go get it. And I'd love to help them go get it and do some sort of pre-order or, or you know, manufacture on demand as long as they're authored well and they're pressed well. Like I know that's difficult too, but there's, there's like ways to, there's ways to grow this business and get creative that I think are, have yet to be explored so i'm i'm hopefully optimistic um but i did want to ask you some more stuff here we just yeah when are we we starting are you you huh yeah when are we we starting yeah Yeah. no we we hit record for sure and this is this is a great conversation but i did want to get into i had some questions specifically hit me on, on the special features i did want to know i actually had a question about dvd authoring which i think we we actually covered pretty well. So that was good. But um, what, what has been, you know, your favorite release that you've worked on? You've worked on all kinds of the big, you know, big blockbuster stuff. We talked hunger games, you've done Rambo movies. Like this is big name stuff. Has there been one that really stood out to you just from like a features perspective, the amount of work you got to do on it that you're really proud of? I think, I think my favorite thing that I've ever done for a variety of reasons, it was probably Knives Out. Um, just because uh, I've worked on a lot of movies that weren't great. Uh, I, I mean, I worked with some directors who brought me over to a studio and they were having them meet me and, and they were like, look, 
our movies are terrible, but our discs are great. And this is the reason why. And they were pointing out, I was like, okay. Um, but, you know, Knives Out was one of those movies where it was a great movie. It got, like, everybody loved it. It had huge rewatchability. I was, I was really given kind of like, you know, open reign to kind of do what I wanted. Um, and, and, and especially on that one, because I got to go up to Skywalker Ranch when they were doing the mix for that. And like Ren Kleiss was the mixer and I was a big fan of Ren Kleiss. And, but, you know, getting to go up and, and like hang out at Skywalker Ranch for five days while they were doing the mix on this and see the movie. I saw the movie in the Stag Theater, which is like the big, amazing theater at the Skywalker Ranch. The first time I saw the movie because they were working on the mix and they were like, all right, look, we're going to go screen. They were just putting like the final mix things in. And uh, I they had a, they were having a screening at Lionsgate that afternoon in in santa monica and i was talking to one of the guys i go yeah i'm kind of bummed like they're having a screening of the movie and i'm gonna miss it because i'm up here and he was like we're watching it in five minutes in the stag like you don't want to watch it down there like watch it in here so the first time i got to see the movie was like in this incredible theater you know george lucas's like personally built theater um and, and so just you know getting to like be in that world and and uh, you know, work with Ryan and, and Ram, his producer, and, and get to do, you know, I did a two-hour documentary on the movie, and, and the reviews were great, and we even got, because we had a little bit of time, because that movie did so well theatrically, we actually had time, so when they went to do the commentary, I brought my camera with me, and I had Ryan do a little kind of closing thing about, you know, it had already opened, and the numbers were good, and the reviews were good, and, you know, I had him record a little thing about like, oh, we just, you know, we just recorded the commentary. And I always kind of like being able to do stuff that is a little more full featured. And so, you know, having him end the commentary or having him in the documentary with them recording the commentary, which really felt like the end of the whole movie process was really satisfying for me to be able to, to sort of have that and put that in there. And that was just one of those discs that, you know, I, nobody... Nobody came back and was like, well, that movie wasn't that great or no. that disc was really terrible or, you know. The whole release was awesome. We talked about the packaging, too. I mean, it was incredible top to bottom. Everything about that release was like they were firing on all cylinders with that with with that release. A, a, a title I really do love that didn't get any attention at all uh, is a movie that came out in 2018 called Kin. Uh, which had Jack Rayner and uh, Dennis Quaid. It was a sci-fi movie. And on that, on that disc, uh, I, the, the directors, which were these uh, twin brothers named Jonathan and Josh Baker, um, had made a short film called Bagman, and then that 21 Laps, which is like Sean Levy's company, they had optioned the short film and made a feature film out of this short film. And Michael B. Jordan was a producer on it and the whole thing. And uh, I met the I met the Baker brothers at lunch to talk about like okay well, what do you want to do because I didn't have anything to do with like the set stuff we but we met for lunch and was like okay what do you want to do for the disc like what do you know, is there anything you want to do is there anything we don't want to do and they were like you know we just we love special features and we want to make sure that ours are really cool and and so you know whatever we could do you know we learned so much from watching special features so we just want to make them really really cool and I was like okay you know we'll, we'll work some stuff out and I'll, you know, so I'll think about what we can do and, and driving home from lunch, I was kind of like, what if we did a special feature talking to other directors about special features and about what they've learned from watching special features and, and, and how important they had become to sort of the process of becoming a filmmaker. And originally it was going to be a very sort of traditional documentary where we were just going to sit down with a bunch of directors. And then that kind of morphed into more of a round table type setting. Um, and so we ultimately, and, and by the way, it should be noted, it is incredibly difficult to get other directors to come and do a special feature for a movie that is not theirs. Uh, Cause everybody's like, especially one that didn't do that well theatrically. Um, I like that movie, but it was like, it bombed and the guys were just like, Okay, so we'll move on and we'll, you know, it's like, okay. Um, but, you know, by the time it was done, you know, by the time we shot it, we had Jonathan Josh Baker, Kevin Smith came in and we were like, well, he's kind of the Rosetta Stone of special features because he's a guy that like was way back, you know, at the beginning. 
Um, we had uh, Daniel Kwan and, and uh, Daniel Scheinert, the, you know, Daniels, who did everything everywhere. They had just done Swiss Army Men. They came in. We had Dan Trachtenberg, who had just done uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. And then uh, Laurent uh, Bozero, who is Spielberg's special features producer. He agreed to come in and, and do. So we have all those guys sitting around talking about what special features they came up on what they learned things that they you know that they loved what kind of things how they react to the on camera you know set stuff the the epk that's on set how they function within you know all these things and it was a really fascinating it's like an hour long conversation with all these directors just talking about like well this is what we learned from this and this is how you know and laurent would have stories about his first titles with Universal and, you know, on Laserdisc, and they didn't have contracts for special features. So they just gave him a feature film contract. It was just like, just sign this and we'll figure it out. And, um, you know, and, and him just telling stories about how they found things in garbage and how he got, uh, you know, Arnold to do the commentary for Conan the Barbarian. And so it was just a bunch of directors standing around talking about how important special features were and 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 kind of how they all became filmmakers watching because the other thing they they pointed out in that feature was you know directors don't often get to watch other directors work like there's there's not a, it's not a lot of time where a director goes to another set and because usually they're working so they're not when they're not working they're not going to go to another director's set and watch them work so they were talking about how special features and documentaries are the only time you really get to see how another director works on set uh, and so that I really love that feature because it was something really unique that I think uh, was I mean, you want to talk about, you know, niche of a niche of a niche. It was like doing a special features about special features uh, was kind of one. And even Laurent said when we were done, he's like, God, I wish I would have thought of this. I wish I would have like this is a really good idea. I wish I would have thought to do something like this. Um and so, I, yeah, so that's another one that I'm that I'm really, you know, we did like, a, I don't know, a 90 minute documentary on this movie and a bunch of other stuff. And, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that. But that's a very that's a very little scene disc. Um, it does have a great steel book, but uh, but that's a that's a very little scene disc that uh, that I'm actually really proud of. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have to check if I have that, because now I'm. I, I don't know that I've seen the movie. I may have the disc. It may have been sent to me. Um, I don't know though. I, I Googled it real quick while you're talking and I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember this one. So I may not have it, but now you've got me interested because that is a super unique, that's like special feature inception. Like we're, yes, we're it's special exactly features, what it is. Special features, which is really, no, that's really cool. I tell people all the time who are, there's a lot of people who follow me and they're like, I want to make movies. I want to do this. I'm like, watch the special features, man. Like yeah. this, this is the only way you're going to see this stuff, especially if you don't live in LA and you're finding, you know, sets True. and you're on studio. Like, yeah. If you're out in New Hampshire, like me, like watch the special features, watch how these guys and girls work. And that's how you're going to learn. It's so, so important. So that's a really cool conversation. Um, I did want to ask, we, we had, I talked to, to Justin uh, beam about special features before. And he had, he worked primarily with like the boutique labels we had mentioned uh, a lot of show factory stuff. He'd actually done some paramount presents, but um, you know, he, he gave us a pretty good rundown of like how that world is like working boutique and then sort of having these things licensed out from the studios. So we talked before and you, you have a little bit of experience doing both. So I'm really mm -hmm. curious, like what the, the difference is and the, the nuance between the two and like, how's that approval process? Do you get more leeway with one than the other? Is there bigger budget one way versus another? Like how, how is it between those two worlds? It's, the, the crossover is the more money you're given, the less leeway you're given the, 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 the approvals become much, much trickier. Uh, the budgets get bigger, but you're, but you have to run a lot more things through people and, 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 and certainly on, on a newer movie versus a catalog title, you know, newer movie, you're going to have a list of people that have approval. You're going to have actors that have approval. You're going to have a director that has approval. And so what you're putting, and that's after the legal department has already gone through it and they've made cuts to things and they've said, no, you got to take that out or this needs to be cleared or, um, 
you know, whereas the boutiques are a little more like, eh, it's fine. It'll be okay. And you're kind of like, oh, okay. Like I, I was a little, I was a little uh, taken aback uh, the, the first time I did a shout title where they were like, no, that's going to be fine. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, that's uh that's a load off my mind, I guess. Uh, so I won't worry about that thing that I would normally be stressed about, but okay. Um, but the shout budgets are also much, much smaller and you're doing those, you know, the shout thing I did into the night. And that was a thing I, I was on a Comic-Con panel with, with Brian Ward from shout one year. And I just kind of leaned over to him and I said, if you guys ever do into the night, I love that movie. Like call me and like a couple of years went by and he called me and he goes, you still want to do in the night? And I was like, yeah. Uh, so that was like another one that was like, you know, almost no budget, but I did it because it was just a movie I loved. I don't get a chance very often to do catalog stuff. So getting to like, and then getting John Landis and getting Jeff Goldblum, you know, we, we never thought we were going to get Jeff Goldblum because he'd said no to them for Buckaroo Bonsai. Um, and, uh, and so they were like, yeah, we're not going to get, we're not going to get Jeff. But then Landis called him. We almost got Michelle Pfeiffer. We were very close to getting Michelle Pfeiffer. And then at the last minute, she was like, eh, I think not. I think like we were going to have her and Jeff together. And, uh, and then at the last minute she kind of was like, eh, I, yeah, I guess probably not. And so we were like, okay. Uh, but like the Jeff Goldblum thing is amazing, but you know, that's one where we pretty much, I had more, I had more back and forth with Landis in terms of what we were doing than I did with, with shout. Um, shout was pretty hands off. Um, you know, Brian had some, you know, he would be like, Oh, well, there's too much music or what, you know, he had, he had some thoughts, but it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't overbearing at all. It wasn't uh, hard to deal with. Uh, Landis was much more like, well, I don't understand. Why are you using this camera angle? I understand what, you know? And so that was where I had to work more with him. Um, but, uh, but the, but the studio side is, you know, you, you certainly have more resources available to you. Uh, it's much easier, you know, when you're, when you're calling or you're emailing a publicist, and you say you're working with Lionsgate or you're working with Sony or you're working with, uh, you know, Hannibal and NBC, it's much easier to get people to respond to you than it is when you're like, hey, I'm an independent special features producer that you probably have never heard of because I'm not on your radar. Uh, but will you send your actor out for, you know, but like with Jeff Goldblum, we were supposed to have him for 20 minutes. He stayed for two hours. And so, and he just, he just kept talking. In fact, I have, these are, you're not gonna be able to see it. These are Jeff Goldblum's handwritten notes that he brought to the interview. Uh, Cause he, he hadn't watched the movie in like 30 years and he watched it like a night before and he just started jotting down like David Bowie and he was just writing down these and then he was done and he crumpled this up and he threw it. And so when it was over, I went yoink and uh, it sits above my desk now. Uh, Brian Ward was not pleased that I grabbed it before he did, but that's not my problem. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so so yeah, it's it's the studio side is more money, more access, but also you know you, you've got marketing people, you've got you, you know there's there's definitely people that are going to um, that are going to have more opinion on what you're doing. And I mean, I had I had a title. I won't say what title it was, but I had a title that basically they wanted me, I had a, about an hour long documentary and they wanted me to get to the actor right away. And the actor doesn't come in until the middle part of this documentary because the whole first part is how they got this movie going, the concepts, the you know, the pre-production, the whole thing, getting the director. Well. Then they start getting into casting. That's the second part of the documentary. And the studio was like, that's gotta be the first part. And I go, well, but that's not how this happened. You're, you're asking me to pulp fiction this thing and put the middle of the story in the beginning and just it and i was like by the way who cares they've already bought the disc why do you need to have this actor be the first thing you see <laughs> right. already, already bought the disc you're not <laughs> like you're not selling any more copies just because this guy's in the thing and they just would not relent and i was like okay and it's the only it's the only thing i've taken my name off of where i was just like i'm, I'm not going to put my name on this because it's not this is not the the version that I would have put together, so that's the that's the double edged sword that you're that you're dealing with um, is that you will occasionally run into people that are like I have an opinion, 
and you're like, but I will listen to your opinion, but I may not agree with your opinion. And then it becomes, it becomes a, who, who ultimately wins. Yeah. Sounds very much like the rest of corporate America that I've worked yes. with for so long. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's pretty standard. Once you get over a certain size. Yeah. The approval process, the too many cooks in the kitchen, the, yeah, the whole thing. Luckily I work with enough other people that will usually side with me. And and the other thing is if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, I have a, a note or I have an idea or I don't understand this or I don't, if it makes sense to me, if, if I say, Oh yeah, that doesn't, you're right. That's wrong. Or that is too much. Or this is, I'm going over the same. If you come to me and you have a thought about something and, and I, you can articulate what your issue is and I see it, I will immediately change it because I just want it to be good. I don't care if it's my idea. I don't care if, if the documentary is better because you told me it's too long or to take this five minutes out or, but if you're just telling me to take 20 minutes out of the middle and move it to the beginning because you want to get to this actor right away. And I go, that doesn't make any sense. And it also tells the story all wrong then I'm, I'm not going to agree with you, uh, you know, but I'm not, I'm not inflexible, you know, in terms of my, no, sure. My ability. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you about a couple movies that you had, you, you sent me a list of movies you worked on and two of them immediately stood out to me. And this is a personal, this is, this is a me question that a lot of people probably don't care about, but there were two movies on there that I were like, these are some of my, guilty pleasure like most underrated movies i think more people should watch and one of them Ooh, i'm now i'm now i'm wondering if i should guess these i i would i would love there's two so i would love if you if you the first one that came to mind is power rangers it's in that world but it's not it's not power rangers it's similar similar style genre and then there were i can't there was one one action movie one comedy one comedy i'm trying to think of what comedy i've done (laughs) Uh, one action movie, one comedy. I mean, Crank always comes up It's with people. It's very similar to Crank, too, I think, in a, in a certain respect. But it was it was Gamer with oh, uh, Gamer. Gerard Butler. That, yes. to me, I, <laughs> I just don't, I don't know what it is. That's super guilty pleasure. I love, like, the world building they did. The action is really cool. Um, it It just feels way more complex and like yeah. than it really should be yeah. <laughs> like it, and it's but just a very ton, underrated it's a ton of fun yeah. so i would love any anything you can give me story-wise about that i'm all ears and the other one the comedy was they came together oh. which <laughs> i think it's just nobody knows this movie and it blows my mind because it's like it's they amy so and paul great. rudd it's like yeah. two of the biggest names in comedy when that movie came out I mean, they were both like peak, like Paul Rudd had done all the Apatow stuff. Amy Poehler was doing Parks and Rec. She'd done SNL. Like they were at yeah. their peak and nobody talks about it. And it's one of the funniest parody movies. I mean, it's up there with like some of the Mel Brooks stuff. If you want to talk about a parody of a romantic comedy, I'm like, this is one of the greatest parodies that's ever been done. And it's so funny. Nobody talks about it. So I wanted I to surface those two. Together. But I would also love if you've got any stories from either of those, just as a personal question for me. Cause so, I- gamer. Well, so gamer comes on on this on this the heels of I had done Crank with with Neville Dean Taylor. That was the first that, that and that was the first big title I'd done. That was the first sort of big budget, big movie, and I started my own company by that point. So that was the first movie that sort of proved like, oh, I can do this. I can do all this stuff. I can get all, all this stuff produced. We can get it delivered. And, and that was the first one that was sort of proof of concept that I, as an individual producer, could actually do this job. And I didn't need a bigger company behind me to make it happen. So that comes on this run of like, Crank, we made a little movie called Pathology that had Milo Ventimiglia. They didn't direct it, but they wrote it and produced it. Um, that, that Fox and MGM released. And then Crank 2 and Gamer were essentially the Back to the Future 2 and 3 of their day. Uh, they were, I mean, they were pretty much shot back to back. Uh, oddly enough, Gamer was shot first, then Crank 2, 
but Crank 2 came out first, and then Gamer came out second. And it was, and just because of how much post they had to do on Gamer. Um, but Gamer was, like, again, because it was it was coming off of, of Crank and everything we'd done with the Crank disc with the picture-in-picture, picture and it had, like, you know, the phone would ring, and you would hit the button, and it would take you to other features, and it was, like, everybody was looking for, like, interactive, interactive, interactive. How can we do all this interactive stuff? And so then we get to Crank 2, and we'd done the picture-in-picture picture thing, and so it was kind of like, okay, what are we going to do next? All right, let's do the picture-in-picture picture thing, except I had a problem because I was like, every time you look at this picture-in-picture picture thing, the thing you're looking at is this tiny window in the corner. You're watching the movie, but what I really want to see is this little window in the corner. I said, let's author it in reverse. So on Crank 2, the picture-in-picture picture mode, if you hit the button, it swaps windows, and you have a full screen with all of your B-roll and all your interviews and everything, and then the movie plays in a little window down below. So that's kind of now we're evolving things, and now we've got a you know we've got a documentary there. So a gamer was really where we went in, and we're like, all right, now we're going to bust this open, and we're going to put the guys on screen, and and basically we were doing maximum movie mode at the same time that. Warner was doing maximum movie mode and Universal was doing U control and all these things. And I think we got beat by Fast and Furious by like a week or two. So it seemed like they did it first, but the reality is we all kind of did it at the same time. Um, but that was another one where I had, uh, you know, because I had such a good relationship with, with Mark and Brian, the directors, um, uh, who coincidentally are the ones that brought me into the meeting and we're like, our movies get terrible reviews, but our discs can't get written. It was those guys when they brought me in for Ghost Rider. Uh, so, uh, they, and they were great. And they would sort of do whatever you needed to do. And and so, you know, but Gamer is a title that if you look at it, we timed it, including the commentary. Uh, there's six and a half hours of, of extra features, like bonus features on that disc. And... Um, and, and we have a little, there's a little thing at the very end of the credits where Gerard Butler basically mooned the directors and he had their faces kind of drawn on his ass. And, and he, you know, he was like, well, how am I going to, am I positioning this? And he had his pants down and they were shooting it. And I was like, am I going to get away with this? And so I put it at the very end and I'm like, look, maybe nobody will even go this far into it. And nobody ever did. Nobody ever said anything. Uh, and years later, I was with Jerry doing another thing, and we started talking about that disc. And he's like, "I don't think I've ever seen it." And I was like, eh, "Okay, well, uh, we'll see how it, how it plays." But I was like, I, "You know, at this point, it's like a little too upset. You know, too too late to be upset about it." Um, but that was a really fun disc because that's another one where we got to like really play around with how how we could do this we called it the icon mode because the in the movie uh you know the the, the players were called icons so the the sort of maximum movie mode our version was called icon mode and so it has mark and brian on screen and they are in front of the movie and they can point to stuff and they could pause it and they could do and it was really fun because all that stuff is really just for as complicated as it seems and as technical as it seems and as sort of production value as it seems it's really just editorial tricks. It's really just going into your editing program and being like, all right, I'm going to green screen these guys over the movie. All right, I'm going to pause the movie here. I'm going to take a still, you know, it's all just editorial. It's not really that complicated. Um, but I, I was really happy with that disc. And again, in, in another way, because that movie wasn't that well received, when the disc came out, a lot of the disc reviews were like, well, I didn't really like the movie, but you got to give these guys credit because they at least sort of, I understand what they were going to do or what they try. You know, it wasn't like they were phoning it in and you can really see the effort. And so the, the nice thing about Gamer was it was the first disc where uh, I was able to really convey the, the, the process in a way where people finally understood like, oh, I don't like this movie but I appreciate the effort that went into it because the documentary gave me enough insight into how this thing got put together. Um, and we had crazy stuff like, you know, getting into, cause they'd shot it to be scope 
And then in editorial, they had opened the mats up because they'd shot it, you know, basically with the with one of the very first red cameras that was ever produced. Um, but they'd shot it to frame for like two, three, five, but they'd watched it in editorial kind of one, seven, eight, and they just got used to that framing. And so just at a certain point, they were like, eh, we'll just leave it that way. And it was like, there was really no more thought to it than that. But it's like getting to ask those guys those questions after the fact um, was really kind of fun and getting to go and like be in New Mexico in pre-production. They could walk me around. We were shooting like the sets and we were shooting all the stuff that they were doing in pre-production so you know we had I, I always love one of my favorite documentaries I'll, I'll digress a lot during this but uh, one of my favorite documentaries uh, is is one that Robert Meyer Burnett did for Superman Returns for the for the simple part that at the beginning of that doc documentary you see Brian Singer and Michael Doherty um, you, you know they're, they're they're at a hotel in Hawaii and they're practicing the pitch for Warner Brothers, that they're going to go in and pitch Superman Returns. And um, and I always loved it because I was like, here's a making of that starts before the movie is even greenlit. Like we're, we're getting into the process of not just a lot of these making of start on day one and they end on the final day of production. And it's like there's so much more to making a movie and there's so much more that's interesting. I mean, honestly, the part on set is in a lot of ways the least interesting part of it because they're all kind of the same. It's the stuff on the fringes that's really the most interesting. And so when you've got footage of what they're doing before the movie even starts rolling, we had a similar thing on Ghost Rider too, where they had no camera equipment. They had they had basically hemmed and hawed for so long about whether they were going to shoot in 3D or convert to 3D that by the time they figured out they were going to convert to 3D, they had no, there was no camera gear available in Europe for them to rent. And they were shooting in like a week. And the producer had to go to India. He had called, he had an Indian passport. He had called and said, we need all this stuff. And they were like, yeah, we've got it all here. And so he had to fly to India and fly back with all of this gear basically as his personal baggage. Um, and so like three days before they're supposed to start shooting, we have footage with the DP in his hotel room where he's like, he's on a plane coming back from India and I'm not going to have time to test this gear. And I hope it's like, I hope it's all right. And, yeah. and so it was like, you know, those are the kinds of things that I love because they give people an insight into all the other stuff that goes into making a movie, not just the, you know, action and cut moments that that happen that you see or the slates doing but all this other stuff that happens and all these other people that are involved uh so gamer was a really good example probably the first example of like being able to show people like how much went into something that you may not actually like but that you will appreciate coming out the other side of it um they came together i like it and it's a great disc so it was a oh, win thank you me. It was a win for me because I like that a, movie. <laughs> it's yeah, if you like it and you like the disc, then then you didn't you didn't huge lose, win uh, for me in, in any way. Um, they came together. I agree with you. One of the funniest comedies, like hugely underrated. I mean, underrated to the point where almost it's almost invisible because just nobody knows about it. Um, and, and that one was, I'm not sure how we did it, but we managed to talk everybody in to coming in for an interview after the fact. So we got Paul Rudd. We got, you know, a lot of times you'll be like, well, especially on these smaller movies, you'll have people that are like, well, they're not available or this person has declined or whatever, you know, because it's not, uh, it's just not worth their time, whatever. I think because these people were so tight as a group anyway, that we were able to, you know, we got Paul Rudd, we got Amy Poehler, we got Christopher Maloney, we got Bill Hader, we got Ellie Kemper, like Jason Manzoukas. because they all came in to, to do interviews. And then those interviews end up being really funny on top. I mean, Bill Hader's stuff is some of the funniest stuff I've ever shot with anybody, just because of the way he tells the stories. Um, and that's a disc we probably could have done a ton more with, uh, but it was just because of the, you know, we were dealing with the sort of time frames and things like that, um, that it was fairly confined in, in what we we're telling. But um, that's just a that's a great disc just because of you just get extra time with all. And then we had they had like the uh, the San Francisco, the sketch fest uh, read. They did a table reading of the script. 
uh, way before they did the movie. And, and so they, um, David Wayne and, and Michael Showalter, who were the writers and, and uh, director, um, had given me that as well and said, well, we have this. And so we were like, oh, well, let's put that on the disc. You know, a lot of producing, uh, at least I, I think a lot of good producing comes from being a consumer comes from being a fan. So if I come to this from what would, if I was going to buy this disc, what do I want to see on it? Which is why we can have a 10 minute conversation about aspect ratios on knives out and whether we're going to shoot digital or film because that interests me. And so I'm, you know, and again, this is at direct odds with what we talked about earlier with like, stop doing it for yourself and start doing it for them. But I consider myself them. So when I'm going to, yeah, so when I'm going to put this together, I'm putting this together from the perspective of if I'm going to buy this disc, what do I want to have on this? And if I want to have the Sketchfest thing, even though I may never watch it, I want it. It's the same reason that I am a huge advocate of always including the theatrical trailer because I'm a big trailer guy. I love trailers. And to me, it is absolutely baffling why the studios don't include their trailers on, the, on their discs when it is a free extra. It is a free bullet point that you can, and, and it's only because you have people at the studio level that are just like, well, I don't understand why you would put an advertisement for the film you already bought on the disc. And it's like, well, because it's its own work of art sometimes, and it's its own thing. And it's a, it's a time capsule of how you advertise that movie. And, and so, I, you know, every time I work on a title, it's like, that's always one of the things that I put in proposals. It's got to have teasers. It's got to have trailers. Um, and, and I'm always going to push for that. Yeah. I love it when, especially for, um, the older movies too. Cause like you, I, yeah, everyone will say, Oh, you go on YouTube and find the teasers and the trailers. Well, still, I want them on my desk because who knows how long those will be up there. But some of the older movies, you, you can't find trailers. You can't find those teasers. So if they have them and they put them on the disc, they really are their own art. I mean, they are so much fun to watch sometimes. And like that nostalgia factor too of like, man, I remember when I saw this trailer, even newer stuff like Force Awakens. And I saw that trailer and I was like, whoa, like Star Wars is back. Like there was a feeling when that hit. I think it hit on like, the middle of a Monday night football game. Like I remember yeah. that because I was watching a game. I didn't care about to watch a trailer. Like that stuff is so cool to me. And, and the, the art form of the trailer is very cool. So, and so if you're, if you're the studio, why not put that on there? Why not make that one of the things that you're adding to that? Like yeah. it almost seems like it, it almost seems like a snub to, to drop it off. Like, well, we don't want to give you that. We don't want you to have that. And I understand that sometimes that there's like music issues and there's rights things that you're doing. You know, I know Top Gun has a car song in it, which is why it's never had the trailer on any of the official releases because there's a car song in the Top Gun trailer. Um, but barring that, if you're just not including it because you just don't want to include it, then I, I don't, you know, I don't understand what yeah. you're doing. No, it's a no brainer to me. Um, well, I've, I've had you for an hour and a half, so I do. <laughs> I appreciate all the time. I never, oh, I, as long as you're good, I, I never want to stretch people too long. But I did want to, uh, I did want to before we before we sign off. We had talked before we even started recording about a couple of releases, and I'd love to hear more about them if you can tease them a little bit. We had talked yeah. about Young Guns, and we should probably clarify here on this podcast as well what's happening with that and Young Guns too in the kind of confusion, I guess that yes. came out initially. Yes. Um, and then the, the Rambo collection that you were working on, I'm super curious about because I have the, I have the big steel book, the Lionsgate steel book uh -huh. collection, which was super cool. So I'm, I'm like, where can, where are they going above and beyond that? Cause now I'm very curious. So anything you can give us on those. All two? right. Which one do you want to start with? Um, let's just start with young guns and then we'll go oh, in the right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so w w we are working on young guns for 4k, but it, it is only the first young guns. And so there, there has been some confusion because we interviewed John Fusco, the, the screenwriter, um, last week. And I think because I asked him some questions about, cause he was the writer of one and two. And I had asked him some questions about two, just in, just in terms of like 
you know, did they know they were making a sequel? Were there things he held back? Was, the, you know, how did they, because in a lot of ways, I, I, I think two is as good, if not in some ways better than, than, than one. But, um, but the fact that both of those movies exist and they're both uniquely good, uh, I started asking him questions about two and, and, you know, he wanted to sort of tease it. And I said, yeah, you know, you, you're free to tease it. And I, so I think he misunderstood that two was part of this. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's one for the 35th anniversary. Um, and so, you know, we are in the process of like gathering people, uh, for, for brand new interviews and, and putting together something really, uh, really work. Cause that's a movie that has been really neglected and I, it's one of the worst Blu-rays that exists. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it will have a new transfer. It will have a new Atmos mix, which is being done. I got to go listen to it. Um, uh, we're interviewing the director tomorrow, actually, which is, I guess, I guess a few days ago now. Uh, so, um, uh, but you know, I, yeah, people are, people are excited about it and they're, and they're getting involved. And, and so, you know, I'm happy to see this title finally get the, uh, finally get the love that it's kind of been uh, withheld for all these years. So to have a really good version of this thing finally out there is, is real. And, you know, I'm sure I, they haven't, they haven't discussed it yet. And I, you know, I don't know what the final plans, but it, you know, if I had to guess, I would assume there will be, you know, some nice uh, metallic version uh, of this with some plastic uh, outer, uh, outerwear uh, that will, I, I'm sure make its way to some fancy retailer at some point. I, I, but I don't know for sure. That's, it's a little, it's a little far out, we, but we'd be looking at like the second half of the year um, towards that, barring any, any, you know, changes or anything like that. But it's definitely big on, on uh, Lionsgate's priority list right now. Awesome. So we got young, young guns, just the first one f right now, and yes. we've got new transfer and Atmos audio uh -huh. plus a bunch of features. So it sounds uh -huh. like that's shaping up to be a pretty good uh, one. To the to the degree there's a there's a YouTube channel uh, that had a teaser trailer that I'd never seen before. Um, it was just something just randomly, and I was able to reach out to them because they had a 4K scan of this teaser trailer, and I reached out to them to say, hey, can we get this? And we'll, you know, we'll clean it up a little bit and, and actually be able to, to, you know, so we're going to be gathering as much stuff as we can, um, for this. So, it, you know, it's a big, uh, it's a big, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a pretty cool release for sure. And it'll be worth the upgrade. Yeah. Um, so then that leaves us with Rambo. Rambo. Yeah. You were teasing me before we even got on here. So now I'm very curious. So I, I, I've, I've let slip some of the details just, just to clear up uh, a lot of misconceptions because there were a lot of people that were running around and a lot of people were, you know, well, which version should I buy? Should I buy the Italian version? Should I buy the UK version? Is the, you know, which version is which version? And the reality is they all are problematic um, just for a variety of reasons because Rambo, you know, most people probably don't know this or if they do they probably haven't processed it this way but you know those all those rambo movies are independent movies they're not studio movies they are they're essentially independently financed they were independently financed initially by carol co and then in the the latter two by um millennium and then you know on, on the first one orion was a distributor on the, and on the second and third tristar was the theatrical distributor but they don't have anything to do with the movies. And then on the last two, Lionsgate did the distribution for those. So, so the idea for Rambo was basically to come at it. The, the model was the Ghostbuster set that Sony did. Um, and, and the model has been to do quite definitively the ultimate set, to find every special feature that's ever been created or produced, we have some new stuff that we're that we're putting together, um, but another big big issue was fixing things that were wrong or not as good as they could have been. So so a great example of that is twenty years ago when they did the uh, 
I guess it was the Ultimate Edition DVD or the special, whichever, whichever, they, like uh, initially Artisan did like a, uh, they did a DVD version that had like a stereo audio track and then they did a newer version that was like a special edition that had Dolby 5.1 and DTS 5.1 or maybe even like EX or something in ES. I don't, I don't remember what their mixes were, but they had essentially limited assets to do these things. And so, um, you know, First Blood was a stereo release theatrically. It was never, you know, never had a 70 millimeter release or anything like that. So that had some elements, they were able to do some mixing, but there was a lot of like issues with uh, audio phasing and things like and wobble and things like that in the audio. Rambo 3 was okay because it had actually some stems available at the time. Um, but Rambo 2 was, nothing was really available. They had mono elements. So all of Rambo 2 had been mixed 20 years ago using mono elements. So, so uh, you know, they maybe had stereo music tracks, but not great stereo music tracks. But if you listen to the 5.1 on, on First Blood Part 2, it's really monocentric. It is very center focused. And it's been one of those things where this movie has never sounded, even compared to the stereo track that had been, released on DVD initially, that track sounds great. Like very dynamic and, and it's all over the place. Um, so we were like, all right, so how do we fix this? And we were like, the, if we could just find a 70 millimeter print, we could probably solve 90% of these problems. So in searching, we found the original 70 millimeter sick track mag for Rambo 2. Um, oddly enough, in the first place we looked, <laughs> which, which was the Sony vault, because they had archived it from TriStar. We got it, we digitized it. Um, it sounds unbelievably good. It is so, like the second movie in particular, sounds so good, both in 70 millimeter, but then I also listened to the Atmos mix, and then, because now the new Atmos mix is based on that 70 millimeter track, and it is, it's never sounded this way. Like people are really, it's like of all the things in the set, it's the one thing I'm most excited about just because we've able to finally get that second movie to sound the way it always should have sounded and hasn't since 1985. Um, so, and then in addition, and, and this goes to what we said much earlier about Lionsgate and sort of being very consumer friendly. Um, you know, we went into this, we did Dirty Dancing a couple of years ago, and we did a brand new Atmos mix for Dirty Dancing, which sounds phenomenal. But we also were very keen to include the 5-1 remix that had been done at a certain point, and also the stereo, the theatrical stereo mix. And so with, with the Rambo set, we're doing the same thing. So you will have the brand new Atmos mix on all the first three films. You will have the 5-1 remixes for one and three that were done initially. You'll have the 70 millimeter mix as the 5.1 on two, and then you'll have the stereo mixes for all three as well. Um, so you really are given, as the viewer, you're given the choice, how do you want to watch this? How do you want to experience this? Um, and, and so all that has been great. Um, we're, we're, we're fixing a lot of the color grading because some of the color grading was problematic. Um, there's, there's shots in part two that they shot day for night. And for whatever reason, when the color grading was done, they crushed all that stuff down. So it looks like night night, but you lose all this detail. You lose characters, you lose backgrounds, you lose all this stuff. And we went back through and we were able to, to restore all of that original look to, um, to the to all three films um and then there's some other issues like with rambo 3 for whatever reason the the first reel is actually off center so if you look at the credits on three everything is sort of you know left justified i guess it would be this way on your camera um it's it's it, it's not centered and so we've been able to go back and fix all that and and you know take out all these weird casts and you know, Rambo three in particular was was very uh, blown out. The highlights were really blown out. So you were losing, you were actually losing detail. We were comparing 
some of these shots in the 4K to the Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray had more detail because the because the HDR had blown out so much of the the actual detail in it. Um, so we were able to go back in and fix all that. Um, so all that's being done with you know with with Last Blood. There were uh, there were actually multiple cuts done, but but essentially there was a theatrical cut, and then there was a final definitive cut that Sly had done, that I think got released in Germany, and then Amazon. I think in America, Amazon had it as like an Amazon Prime thing. So both of those cuts will be on there. Um, uh, Rambo will have both cuts on there, um, and uh, and so it's it's essentially you know like I said the Ghostbusters set that came out from Sony was kind of the model for this. Um, there will be some cool like pack in things with it uh, that are actually pretty awesome. Uh, some archival stuff that we that we secured that you know we we've, we've we've been able to like do you know reproductions of and and uh uh and include with the with the set so um it'll be pretty good it's it's we were it was it was it was supposed to come out last year for the 40th anniversary but it just is it's taken us longer to just make sure it's right and so i i saw somebody the other day post and say like oh how much longer until this thing gets officially announced and it's like well it's going to get announced when it's ready. Like we're not going to announce it until it's until it's ready to go. And that's, you know, that means if that means it's a year later than the 40th anniversary, it's a year later than the 40th anniversary, it wouldn't have been anybody's choice, but it means that we all really focused on it. Lionsgate has been very dedicated to just making this thing really cool and just being, you know, and again, speaking to that collector mentality of being like we know you guys have bought these movies a million times. We know you could go buy the 4K for five bucks right now at Walmart. This is not that. This is a this is a totally separate thing. To to the to the degree, I think this will happen. Um, uh, you, we've talked about it. If it doesn't, you can blame me uh, for uh, not being able to pull it off. But you know, it'll it'll probably be like a digit, you know, a, a digi style, you know, fold out packaging. But I but I've been uh, I've been trying to push to have uh, cover inserts, printed cover inserts included in the set. So if you wanted to, you could take five cases, take the inserts with the with the poster. So the Drew Struzan and the all the actual like style A artwork on there, and you could take your own five cases and you could put the slips in and you could put the disc in and put those on your shelf. And and if that's the way you prefer, again, it was all about giving the the consumer giving the collector their say in terms of like this is how I want this is how I want to present it this is how I want to watch it this is how I want you know all these things to to happen so um but there's yeah I mean there's some there's some really cool stuff that we found um uh specifically with David Morell the author uh the original first blood author like he had some stuff that we were like oh all right we'll We'll grab that from you. Okay, great. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty great. It, it's gonna be pretty great. It'll it'll hopefully be later this year. I don't know exactly when, um, but again, it's it's it, it's it's been uh, a big priority for everybody. And we're just you know we want it to be really good because we do also we do also know that it's probably the last time that it gets released on any sort of physical media. You know that there's probably not going to you know unless they go and they do individual releases at some point in time you know there's not going to be in 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 four years they're not going to go back and do a 45th anniversary rambo set with all new transfers and all new you know it's like this is probably the swan song for for the rambo films on any sort of physical media so it was it was really like let's do it right let's blow it out like let's really make this worth everybody's time and money so that when you get it, you know, in the same way that Ghostbusters set felt like you got something. Um, now, hopefully, unlike the Ghostbusters set, this will actually be available. And you can <laughs> buy it. You can buy it past street date. Yeah, um, that one was impossible to get. Yeah, that was a that was a bit of a miscalculation on on Sony's part. You know, this is I think they're they're looking at those sorts of things and wanting to make sure that they don't they don't hit upon that same mistake. Um, but uh, it, it'll be it'll definitely be worth 
the weight when it comes. That's out. awesome. This is great news because you know what yeah. the, the the consumer at this point is the collector. So we are we're absolutely we're one in the same, and that that is going to be awesome to find those new new elements is is always incredible. Um, because yeah, I'm the, telling you, man, when you hear the new mix, like we actually not even the new mix, when you hear the old mix <laughs> on Rambo Two, it's, yeah. It's incredible. Like I was just like I had chills in on the on the stage when I was listening to all the stuff he'd done, um, and it was just, it was unbelievable. Like how much of a difference it was over what we've gotten used to over the last twenty years. It's all yeah. No, that's I'm all. Very and excited. It goes to show like this is how important physical media is to just like preservation of film because like without this release who would have gone and found we would have never it never would have have had had it you you would live with that 5-1 mix the rest of time it like there are so many incredible forgotten films and prints found of films that didn't think existed and just because people went searching for a it's always yeah. a physical release too looking for those best elements and all of a sudden there's a new well look at what happened with uh with superman with them finding you know with them grabbing the 70 millimeter six track from that and like that thing sounds phenomenal like i don't want to listen to the atmos mix i want to listen to that 70 millimeter mix because it sounds so good and it's so and i'm hoping i don't i mean i don't know what they're doing with it but i'm hoping with this new superman set that they're that they're getting ready to announce probably tomorrow I'm hoping that they're actually reauthoring the disc to include that in in lossless this time, uh, instead of instead of the the lossy version that we got before, because I think it would be worth doing it again as a as a, a true HD or you know a DTS master with that original track. But um, but again, who knows? They may announce it tomorrow, and it's like, oh yeah, that track's not on there anymore. It's like who knows? I yeah. Well, like we said, who who knows why some of this stuff is being done at all. But <laughs> but yeah, no, it is. It's so important. Like these are just just anything that keeps these movies, you know, alive and in their best available format is is so important because otherwise they just I just I'm I'm always blown away by the amount of movies that never even made a jump to Blu ray and H D masters and the stuff that's just floating around out there that could easily just disappear and just kind of be forgotten without ever having that treatment and it's not just obscure movies there's tons of very well-known big hit movies that have not made that leap so that's that's why we support this stuff because it's so important it's not just we're not just collectors and like it's a it's a real preservation effort like across the board if you're supporting it absolutely is buying these discs you're supporting preservation you're supporting these these efforts that are going on around the world and hopefully there's more of them and they find more great stuff in somebody's attic or in a storage container somewhere it's always amazing where they come across these things but they're out there so we just got to keep looking all right well this has been one of the better episodes i think we i i've done this has been very informative we covered a bunch this is a lot of fun i learned a lot so thank Good. you no so problem. much and fun. if you guys stuck around for the full we're pro- with my intro and everything that i add we're probably at about two hours so that'll break a record for longest episode but i'll tell you guys if you're still here i think you know it was it was well worth it and i will uh yeah you know, i'll make sure I stuff until the very very end <laughs> that's all right you, know about but, Rambo, you gotta wait till the very end yeah well we'll tease yeah we'll we'll tease that i'll tease that in the <laughs> intro i'll say look there's a good two hours well, here. Don't, of tease it. don't tease it in the intro because then they'll just skip to the end. Oh, that's true. You know yeah. what? I've got to get. I've got to get better at this whole podcast. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say you got to you got to stick around for the whole thing because if you don't watch the middle, you won't understand the end, and you won't yeah. understand. The, yeah, it's it's like that yeah. documentary you put together. We, you got to yeah. watch it in order, or it's not going to make order. sense. Yeah, it's a conversation. Well, I appreciate it. This was awesome. Where can, uh, right before we sign off, where, where can people find you? Give you your turn to, to plug yourself and your websites, whatever you want to plug. I mean, I don't, I like I'm at Cliff Stevenson on Instagram, but that's about it. I don't have a Twitter. I don't have a Facebook. I don't have like uh, any of that stuff. I let my, I let my, my making of do, <laughs> do all of my, do all of my talking. So uh, I, I don't need to go and talk more. Nobody wants to hear more from me. 
Oh, that's awesome. Well, Instagram <laughs> it is. And you guys got to go support the work. That's where you find his stuff. Yep. You know, keep he's trying, on. Keep watching. And, and here, it, listen, if I can make one plea to your, to, your, to your viewers and listeners and everyone else, here's my plea. Because this is the most disheartening thing about this is, you know, I think sometimes, and I, look, I get it. But, you know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in slip covers and transfers and all and and people don't talk about special features anymore they don't talk about the 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 extra material that gets put into this and and it almost like you know and that ends up being a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy too where you have studios that go well should we really be doing this if nobody's really talking about it or nobody really cares about it nobody really reports on it um and I, you know, I had a review for everything everywhere all at once on one of the websites that basically it was literally just a listing of the, of the special features. Like it wasn't really a review. It was just basically a copy paste of the, of the press release. And they were like, well, they could be better. And I was like, well, in what way? Like, tell me in what way I, like I'm, if it's not, you know, if there's, if, if you, if you didn't think we're good, I'm all ears to tell me what way you thought it was, but if you're just going to copy paste the press release and then go, well, they could be better. It's like, well, are you reviewing the special features or are you reviewing the press release? Because the special features are not the press release. And I heard from somebody over there and they were like, well, he doesn't watch everything because most of it's really bad. And I was like, well, then what's he reviewing for? <laughs> if, he's, if, he's, if he's skipping stuff that's actually decent because the most of it's bad. So it's like, you know, for, for, for your viewers, it's like, talk about the stuff you like if it's good discuss it let people know it's good let people know uh that, that you know it's worth their time because more of that stuff will get produced if it if it if it gets more traction if, if people you know there's so many so many things get sort of killed because everybody goes well it's just an epk thing and it doesn't really have any substance to it and so then anything that sort of falls under that umbrella gets dismissed as oh it's just generic epk and it's like every once in a while you'll get something that may not be long but it's in depth or it's or it's it's actually got something to say and a lot of times it just gets dismissed because it's not you know it's not part of the bigger conversation of did i get a slip cover with my with my thing and all of a sudden you've got three pages of forum things about who got a slip cover on their thing. I was like, well, are you watching the movie or are you watching the slip cover? I don't understand. <laughs> right. Or right. buying this is, yeah. piece of cardboard. Um, yeah. Like, okay. But no, but, I've, I, it's, that's been a takeaway for me too, honestly, talking to you, talking to you, talking to, to Justin, talking to people who, who work in this. Like I've, I've definitely been guilty too. Of like I get, I get too in the weeds on how's the thing look and how's it sound. And I even said like this year with my content, every 4k review I've done, I've opened up by talking about the movie first and foremost, like, did I like it or not? Because like, first of all, why, like, <laughs> you gotta buy stuff you like. So I'm, I'm going to give you yeah. my thoughts on that, which I honestly hadn't done before. And I'm like, what am I doing? Like I buy these first and foremost, I buy these because I like movies, not because I like cardboard or steel books or yeah. Right. Shiny, shiny yeah, disc. Movie lover. It's the movie and it's the content that's on that disc. And it is, it is the features a lot of times that I would tend to gloss over on some releases. And I've tried not to do that anymore because it is a, it's a big piece of it. So that, that has definitely been a takeaway for me. And I know I've been guilty of it and trying to, uh, trying to get better as well with the, with the review versus sometimes, yeah, you just, you list them off and you're like, well, here's what there is. And there's a few deleted scenes and they were pretty good. And there's this commentary, but it's like, well, th there's more to it than that. You know, it's, well, and it's I, a... listen, I, I also understand that like not everybody's got time to listen to 12 commentaries a day. You know, I used to listen to every commentary that ever got recorded, you know, back in the laser days, days, you, you, you know, or the DVD, you listen to every single commentary. Now it's like, it's physically impossible to do all that stuff. But that's why I think it's important um you know that that channels like yours exist because you can be a voice for the things to say oh this is like i would i really am legitimately interested in your take on kin not necessarily the movie i don't care if you like the movie or not uh but if you watch that round table 
you know, I am curious if you if you think that's interesting, if you think that's unique, because because I I've I've heard from people that are like, oh, I bought that disc solely for that feature because that feature was was so interesting or so unique. I think if and I don't so, have it, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like I, you know, I'm always interested in, in if there's stuff that people are like, oh, I didn't like the movie or I didn't care for the movie, but I own the disc because this document. I mean, you look at like the stuff that that Charlie did with with Alien, you know, with the Alien quadrilogy, and you're like, well, I don't really like Alien Resurrection, but I love his documentary, and I can't not own that disc just because I don't love that movie as much as I might like the first two. Um, so, you know, it's like giving giving some footing to things that are like, oh, yeah, this has value, not for the thing you thought it was going to have, but for the thing, for this thing over here, uh, even on something like Planes, Trends and Automobiles, where I know that that was not a great disc, but it was like, but you got all those deleted scenes, you got all that extended material, and you're kind of like, well, it's worth it for this stuff in some ways, as long as we call out and say the transfer is not very good, you need you guys need to get better at the transfer thing. Um, but I'm still voting with my wallet to buy this disc because I really appreciate you guys, including all of these deleted scenes and all of this extended material that was never available before. And so, you know, that's, that's the great thing about a channel like yours is that you you're putting weight on, on things to be like, yeah, there's a, there's a physical media and it's not just this one part. It's the packaging, it's the steel book, it's this, it's the transfer, it's the audio, it's, the special features it's all it's the whole package the whole physical media package is this thing and, and that's what i think is really important uh for people to remember is that you know if you just wanted the movie in a in a brown paper bag they they would easily accommodate you um but you know even like you were saying with the menus where it's like when you get just a play and a subtitle and there's not even a chapter selection, and you kind of feel like, well, I just feel like the presentation's not that great. And it's like, how I, look, how many times are you going to use the chapter menu? Probably almost never. But the fact that it's missing feels like you're losing something. Uh, it feels like you've kind of been, you know, you've gotten a lesser, especially version. for for what you pay for some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you feel a little bit, yeah. So no, I I appreciate that because I am trying to, I'm definitely trying to do more of that. Is like give that full picture. Um, I always have, like, I've always made sure, and not everybody who reviews discs does this, but I will do. I'll give you video, audio, packaging, and special features. We're going to talk all four because this yeah, is seriously, right. I mean, that is why you buy it. If you only care about the video or audio, you know, most people, you might be able to get away with, you know, most people don't care about, you could get away with the digital purchase of something. Yeah, and, and not, it, or whatever that is. Right. So, yeah, I do. I appreciate that because I do try to. I try to cover all of it. And even with planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, like I, I think I said in that review, yeah, you get all these scenes that were never found before. It's the only way to watch them. So there's a positive. Right. And regardless, like, yes, the transfer wasn't great, but the Blu-ray was also terrible. And this is actually better than that. So it's still the best version you can own, even if it's not that good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you got to try to find the positives and all this stuff because... Um, there's always something there's always yeah. something even if the movie's not good maybe there's a great documentary on that disc so look how many versions of predator do we have before they finally got it right uh i i have all of them so yeah quite a few <laughs> yeah it's like finally 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 they got it right That's a lot yeah of well this has been a lot of fun seriously so thank you i learned Thanks, a bunch Jeff. yeah and uh, it's awesome having you'll definitely Anytime. Have to have you back. Maybe maybe we'll do a uh, maybe we'll do a round table of special features producers and and uh, uh, do a whole there there we go. You got me thinking now. Uh, so maybe we'll do something like that. But no, this has been great. I appreciate it. You guys go check out Cliff's work. I'll leave a list in the in the video descriptions too of all the different uh, or good chunk of the discs you've worked on. Quite a few discs, but I'll leave a big chunk of the discs he's worked on. You can see his work on there, and we'll link to that the one place they can find you on Instagram and yeah, we'll just keep supporting physical media. So that's, that's, that's it. what it's all about. Keep chugging along. All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you, Jeff. I'll, I'll catch all you guys on the, on the other side in the outro. 
All right, everyone. So that was our interview with Cliff Stevenson. As he said, you can you know check out a bunch of his work. I'll put some of the titles down in the video and podcast description, but we talked about a bunch of the ones he's worked on here in this episode as well. He had some really good scoops. I'm super excited for this Rambo set whenever it comes out. Young Guns sounds like it's going to be an excellent 4K release. Tons of great stuff coming still to physical media. So physical media is not going anywhere as long as guys like Cliff are out there doing the work, putting the work in, getting all these bonus features made and really pushing hard for studios to put out great physical releases. So appreciate him and all he does. If you want to check out his work, I'll leave his Instagram link down in the description and you can find all of his different bonus features across many of discs that you probably already own in your collection, stuff like Hunger Games or Rambo. Like you probably already have this stuff. So if you haven't watched some of it, Go check it out. He does great work. So anyways, I appreciate you guys sticking around. If you watch the whole two hours or listen to the whole two hours, you are a true films at home, a loyal follower. You're amazing because I know that's a lot of time to commit to one piece of content. So thank you for that. And even if you didn't listen or watch the whole thing, thanks for just coming out. Thanks for coming out to the podcast and listening to some of this interview and and conversation because it's fun for me to do. I think it's fun for you guys to listen to. You've told me you're having a good time with it. So we're going to keep this thing going. If you do want to see more episodes, help me out. Let's rank this thing up. Leave me a five-star review if you're enjoying what you're seeing. Let me know on YouTube in the comments what you thought. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Make sure you follow the podcast everywhere. I'm on Apple, Spotify, you name it. And let's just keep growing this thing because it's been a ton of fun to do. And the more episodes we do, the more exposure we get. Hopefully, the you know we can keep getting more and more and more guests. So stay tuned. Got some great guests coming at the end of season two here. I'll take a little break and then we'll be into season three, but you guys are really going to enjoy this. So thank you for listening and or watching. If you're on YouTube, some of you guys do both. You're the best, but I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy out there. And I will talk to you all soon. Coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.